we're friends with Danielle Najeev, so we know oh, okay, cool. uh, a little bit about what's going on here, and obviously read as things started what was happening. Cool. So, so look, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a background um, as we kind of do a little walkthrough. So, um, the Moish House, the traditional way that they normally do it is you actually get a group of people who want to live together. Um, and then they go to the Moish House and they apply to the national organization. I believe there's like 42 or 50 houses around the, around the world. And what we did here was a little bit different. Um, and so events go every, everything from pretty regular Shabbat dinners, at least one or two a month, to we had a butter making workshop, we had <laughs> yoga classes. Um, next month we're starting weekly boot camps. So we're going to start building community through health and wellness. Um, the Jordan is the is the uh, local community also getting involved? So you've got the, the the young Jewish crowd coming in and doing that. What about some of the folks who are living in and around here as well? So like for a barbecue and stuff like that, we invited all the neighbors, so the neighbors all came and um, and yes, yeah, so we're that's what actually a lot of my focus is on is going outside the Jewish community because I think that's the need. We've already kind of done a lot of our work that we've set the foundation in the Jewish it's, community. I'm a believer that you're going to see like the next you're going to see like new organizations come out of the Moisha House. So because all the residents are here doing programs and events, there's an opportunity to take things that are successful that are being done out of here and grow them into their own organizations or nonprofits or causes or whatever. And I think that's a really powerful um, opportunity um, to, because you're letting them, people in their 20s, mostly in their 20s, do it on their own. Nationally, so. they're really in tune to just letting the residents own it. So really in tune to like hearing what they want and how to make it better and stuff like that. So, who funds them on a national level? So the main funders, um, I believe, are Schusterman and Jim Joseph. Jim Joseph, I think, was their first main funder. Right. Is that right? Yep, it is. Yeah. Um, and then Schusterman. So those are like the two big, the two biggest funders of them. And then I know all of their most all their funding then comes locally. So um, that you raise the money locally here, and then they may ma they match a little bit or something like that from the national organization. They were so they've been very impressed with the Detroit community because of how coordinated we are, and so like they actually we work they work with the federation. The federation actually administers the program here, so it's all coordinated, and so they really they try to do that in more communities now because we. Because it's such really, a the funding such a better is is really just to keep the house going. So like, there's nothing specific that that the that there's we're fundraising for. It's more of like, this has been so successful. We're June will be our first year, so in a month will be our first year. It's been so successful and has so much impact that just c keep getting funding to actually sustain it, so it can be have funding for three or four years, just so it's here and it's not going to go anywhere, um, or potentially open a second house. Mm. But there's no like agenda. On it, it's more of like this has been really successful. Um, if we can get continued support from the community, we can just continue doing this, and maybe there's a second or, or third house. I th if I'm not mistaken, I, it's really it's it's something like forty thousand dollars a year is the budget per house, or thirty five thousand dollars a year, or something like that, and that includes like Moisha House administering it and stuff, and something like that. So you get you think you know you, how many touch points you're getting for that amount of donor dollars. It's a ton. Um, compared to other programs and things that I've seen, <laughs> I've seen in the, in the community. So right. Um, but yeah, I don't. I I, I would definitely say I'll, I would turn you over to um, probably Jen mm -hmm. at Moisha House on like the funding questions because they kind of handle the at least the the um, where we're at funding wise and stuff like that. I think we do. All right, so here we are at the downtown synagogue. You guys want to say anything about the the last visit to your cousins? Uh, we had a, an, an educational visit with the uh, the, the Detroit Moshe House. Uh, learned about uh, what they're doing to be involved in the community and uh, what their 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 plans for the uh, immediate future. Great. Now we're going to the synagogue. Cheering, uh, we, we've we've broken the two groups. I'm cheering the the Jewish effort this year, and there's also another uh, group that's focusing on, on Detroit. We're we're looking also in the Jewish community in Detroit, and also possibly looking to find something to fund uh, in Israel. 
Um, last year we, we funded two trips to, um, to Israel, one through uh, Michigan State's Hillel and another one through the Ann Arbor. Your cue about um, how I got involved. Yeah. So my parents moved here from Israel, so I'm Israeli, speak Hebrew fluently, you know, very, very connected to Israel. Um, and my parents moved here from Israel. I was born in the Cass Corridor. You know, terrible. my dad was getting his PhD at Wayne State, and uh, it was, eventually they moved out, of course, you know. But I, so I don't remember anything from the city. But they moved to Oak Park, Southfield, then Bloomfield. And then, you know, I went to, I went to U of M for undergrad, I went to law school for Wayne State, and I think through my, I think Wayne State is a great connector to Detroit. I think one of the one of the primary connectors that, that bring people to the city and, and, and get them integrated in what's going on. So through Wayne State Law School, I became involved with the city. I always knew that I wanted to do social change type work, which is the reason I went to law school. But I knew when I was looking for a house after law school, I knew that I was going to buy in Detroit. I mean, there's no question. My parents, you know, they were like will pay you money to not buy in Detroit. <laughs> I swear, they're like, we'll help you significantly with your down payment if you buy, just buy in Ferndale, buy in Royal Oak. And I said, no, work and no, see all the, the opportunity for change in the city. So I bought my house in 2008. Again, no Jewish connection. Very strong Jewish identity, but I just never never had many Jewish friends, Didn't don't know much Jewish ritual. And, uh, and then I found this place in 2007, walking around on a Friday, building, you know, seeing it and saying, what is this, really a synagogue? Never knew about it. The owner next door comes out, greets me, talks about, yeah, this is an actually active synagogue. I come in the door, meet the guy cooking in the basement, the guy out, out front, and he tells me, yeah, it's active. But pretty much at that time in 2007, this was, there was no activity going on here. I mean, there was only Saturday services, and then we'd have like a second Seder every year. But it was pretty, it was on its last limb, if you will. Uh, I, I just remember one of the, so there was a group of Jewish activists, the kind of pe people that came together and said, we're Jews, we live in the city, we want a place to go. A synagogue, yes, but also a place where we can, we can be, we can congregate, we can you know, create a community. So um, through that effort, we kind of came together. And Eventually, I mean, with the at that time in 2007, time. the board of directors was considering closing the place. I mean, they were going to list this building. Now, this is, this is a, one of the reasons that we got passionate about it. I mean, I think the reason that we uh, got passionate about it is because not because we particularly had the time or the or the like Money. or the or the knowledge really to run a synagogue. I mean, you know, I, we didn't know anything about it. We just knew that we were, we we were Jews. We lived in the city, and we wanted a place to be. So we all came together and wanted to do something about it. Well, we decided we couldn't let this last freestanding synagogue in Detroit go away. So we we started to you know work hard at it. So that was in 2007, 2008. We got a few of us got elected to the board of directors, and I think there's there was like a change in leadership, and um, we just started to put on a variety of programming. And it, in short, the the movement, is, if you will, grew. I mean, I think people recognize the value of this location near Woodward, near the financial district. We do stuff for businesses, for Jews that work downtown. We do stuff for the people that live in the city. We do stuff for people that want that live in the suburbs, but they want a connection to the city. There's so many Jews. There's so much rich Jewish history here. And so we've kind of, in some ways, we fulfill all of these, like, these... I don't want to say, Marty, our, our former president, has called our institution schizophrenic. And that might seem you know, negative, but in some ways it's true because we fulfill all these functions. We're like a hub of Jewish activity in the city, and we fulfill the function of the business community down here, the people, the Jews that work downtown. The function of, of travelers and visitors that come from conferences to the book Cadillac and to the Rensun that they want a Jewish place to say Kaddish or a Jewish place to, to uh, you know, just observe, to pray. Um, we fulfill the needs of the Jews living in the city, and now there's a growing number of Jews that are moving in living in the city, so we fulfill that function. The fourth one, of course, is like I mentioned, is the, the, the Jews from the suburbs, whether it's my parents or whether it's you, know, you or whether it's anybody that, that feels like they want a connection to Detroit. So they can come here and they can feel, you, you can feel it. With the, with the, with the uh, wood paneling, you um, feel like... And when I heard in, that you know, the synagogue history, was going to uh, close, you know, I'd never been here, but it's like... Oh, that's such a shame that it's just too bad, and I did nothing. <laughs> and so when I heard that these guys, you know, a few years later, um, came along and did something, like, you know what, I want to be part of that. And then when I saw this Windows campaign, you know, I was like, well, look at this, you know, I, in like less than a month, I raised all the money. I mean, it was kind of, well, you know how those things go viral. So, um, and then, um, you know, so I've been thinking about it, but then, of course, when I met Lior, 
you know, you can see. I'll start I mean, so just that's our social hall, which we were just in. The social hall is where a lot of activities happen. That's where our lunch and learns happen, our kiddush on Saturday mornings. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, like, Friday night dinners, those kind of things. Um, rock shows, dance parties, whatever it may be. Our lectures, art shows. And then, this is the foyer, okay. Uh, this, is a, this is a library, um, and I think it's been a library for many years. Yeah, it's got a very old book that I can tell it was written down. Yep. And in there is the, oh, I don't know what they were going to say, but this is one of the architectural uh, proposals. Yeah, nice. Now you would think. Can you tell, like, tell about who needs the services? I mean, it's really sure. a very beautiful service when there's young people from the congregation who don't have a rabbi. Yeah, there's a number of people. I mean, it depends. So, Miriam Liebman and Noam, uh, Noam Kimmelman from Fresh Corner Cafe, who you might know, he leads the service. They lead the service on Friday nights. Also, uh, Ruby Robinson, and they're both, I think they're definitely both in their 20s. Uh, Natus. Ruby, Rebecca Natus, she is. She's, she's got an amazing voice, and she's, she's leaving for a little bit, but she's committed to coming back in Detroit, and she wants to be a part of this when she comes back. But she, she dobbins, uh, she links Torah for us on Saturday mornings, and she also sings on Friday nights, and she comes to some of the, our other events. And it's another person, um, Ruby Robinson, he's a lawyer, I went, went to law school, went to the same law school, and he moved down. Because it's so interesting. Why was that? Because it was very close to the Here's an interesting the sanctuary. Um, on the second floor here, and what we, one of the, of the architects proposed to move it and create like the second, this fifth floor here, and have it be on the very top two levels and have like a, be, be a bigger atrium space, mm. which was really exciting. So this is the third floor. The fourth floor pretty much looks the same, um, but you can see. So you're, so you're thinking, well, what can this be used for? And the top two floors, here floor, I mean, we we're looking at how to best configure the space, but the idea of having office space that would also help generate revenue and income so that it would be more sustainable. And also meeting space, which we could, of course, use for our own events, but also rent out if needed. And sometimes, of course, we rent it out, other times we probably just let the order. There's a coffee shop on the corner. You have several people involved with the downtown Savannah that do food stuff. Like you've got Noam Kimmelman doing Fresh Corner Cafe. You've got Blair Nelson who does pickles and does makes like cream cheese and all kinds of like fermented products. You have the, the ben, and, ben and Dan Newman who now live in Corktown that have participated here. They have Detroit Institute of Bagels. So you have like that's three of, out of others that are doing food related things. Like let's, let's all come together and either offer this space here or have it be on this block, so you have, a, you know, a block away, or right. you know, right next door, you have the place where Jews are making food, whatever that place ends up being, and you can have bagels and you know, bagels and lox and fresh coffee in the morning. And I actually think that, from an economic perspective, but also like our mission perspective, not saying the synagogue would like own it or anything, but it would be great for for building community, for like having a business that's sustainable for the synagogue, but also to support the community that's growing. Yeah, that from great. Not having much programming, so now we have Thursday morning services, Friday night services, which are really well attended. We have people come from all over to enjoy Friday night with us. Saturday morning services. We've got Sunday classes, Jewish classes, introduction to Judaism, uh, um, Hebrew learning. We've got Yiddish classes on Wednesdays. We've got a book club that is that was last night. We have... Um, D Detroit Interfaith, Interfaith Outreach Network, which is a group of pastors and imams from Hamtramck, from Dearborn, from all across Detroit that come together to meet to talk about social justice issues specifically, um, about how to uplift Detroit, and they do they have programming that reflects that. I hope that so um, we have. We, I mean, we have uh, some materials that talk about some of our programming. Also, our website has our current events. And what, I'll pro what I'd like to do after this meeting is send you anything that you think would be helpful information-wise, but also send you our, our newsletter, our last newsletter, which was made, just to give you a sense of the, the things going on. Yeah. So this is Cafe de Mongo's, which is next door. Yeah.